Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Corey Hayes and I've come to talk to you today about evolution and the human soul, not so cleverly subtitled Darwin meets Thomas Aquinas. Now before I get into the meat of the talk, I would like to tell you all a story. And our story begins, contrary to what you might think, according to the title of my talk, it begins not that long ago. It begins in the year 1976. In 1976, in Laetuli, Tanzania, a set of 3.6 million year old fossilized footprints were found. These footprints were made by apparently three creatures who walked through a pit of volcanic ash, making a trip from one wooded area to another. Now, if you look at these footprints, it's very easy to see they are remarkably similar to our own, in fact. So similar that this fossilized specimen is one of the earliest, if not the earliest example of bipedalism, or upright two-legged walking. Now, these fossils were made by this species. They are associated with this species, Australopithecus afarensis. Now, this Australopith you see here, this reconstruction is of Lucy, which is perhaps the most famous Australopith fossil. Now, in Africa at the time, climate change was going on in such a way that Africa was becoming hotter and drier. And a country at once filled with woodlands, those woodlands were beginning to recede and shrink, giving way to open savanna. And for reasons we will never know, some intrepid primates who had formerly been tree dwellers decided to make their way on the open savanna. Now, they relied more on their own two feet than their climbing abilities. And this way of life with selection pressures seemed to open the road for the development of much manual dexterity. And we see this manual dexterity um, in fossils we find dating from about two million years later, about a million years later, rather. In the 60s, um, in sediments dating back to about two to two and a half million years ago, um, sets of stone tools and hand axes were found. And the fossils associated with these hand axes were dubbed Homo habilis, or handyman. Now these hand axes are very crude, very primitive. Um, they seem to have a haphazardness about them. But for all of that, they were very efficient at butchering animals and flesh. Now, the teeth of Homo habilis strongly suggest that they were mainly herbivores, but the hand axes and their usefulness at butchering also strongly suggest that this diet was supplemented with meat, probably butchering large animals, most probably carrion and things left over from predator kills, that kind of thing. Now, much more striking are these hand axes. These large teardrop-shaped axes were carefully worked on both sides to produce a specific and very efficient shape. If you look at them, they all tend to be about three times as long as they are wide. Uh, mechanically, this is a very efficient shape for cutting and also penetration. Now, these hand axes are associated with this species, Homo ergaster, or working man. Um, this example or this skeleton of a homo ergaster um, is that of the Turkana boy named after Turkana Kenya where he was found. Um, he has a much larger brain than um, Australopiths, um, a higher degree of manual dexterity than Homo habilis, and his life seemed to be perfectly suited in his capabilities to the open savanna. Now this increasing in brain size um, and in sophistication and tool making also seem to go in step with increased forms of social life and social cooperation. Um, there's a great deal of evidence that Homo ergaster and most species after him hunted and took down large game in large groups. Now the level of social cooperation that would be required for such hunting um, is something that is virtually unknown to us. Um, human beings hunting with modern weapons have enough, have hard of enough time in hunting. Um, the amount of social cooperation and effort it would have taken Homo ergaster um, is really quite striking. Now, this increasing social cooperation um, takes an interesting turn. In the ruins of a medieval town called Demanisi in the Republic of Georgia, 
there were fossils found that were dubbed Homo erectus because he has a more sort of upright shape than Homo habilis. Now, in these remains were found the skull of a man. The skull dates to about 1.8 million years ago. And this particular skull is of an older man with only one tooth. Now, what's striking about this find is that from analysis of the skull, we can tell that all of his tooth sockets had shrunk to such a degree that he had been with one tooth for a very, very long time um, before he died. Now, this doesn't seem totally significant, but it will eventually show us a great deal of evidence for this, prosociality. Here's what I mean. In order for this older man to eat, someone would have had to have processed and chewed his food for him. This kind of behavior is paradigmatic pro-social behavior. Pro-sociality being any behavior in which a member of a group acts in such a way to alleviate another group member's need or improve another's welfare at a cost to its own self. In other words, expending your own energy to care for a number, another member of the group that cannot care for themselves. Now, these fossils and that skull in Georgia is associated with this species, Homo erectus or upright man. And by the way, um, it is disputed among paleontologists whether Homo erectus and Homo ergaster are in fact two different species or the same. Now, if we continue on, in a place in southern France called Terra Amata, there are evidence and remains of artificial shelters dating to roughly 400,000 years ago. They were discovered in the year 1966. The dwellings were oval-shaped, fashioned out of saplings and rings of stone. In one of them, a shallow area was filled with blackened stones and burnt bones, um, undoubtedly a primitive cooking hearth. Now, Hominids had been using fire as early as 700,000 years ago and controlling fire. But this shows the first evidence of home and hearth, of cooking and domestic social life. Now, in 1994 to 1998, in Schoeningen, Germany, eight remarkably well-fashioned wooden spears were found. They were preserved in a peat bog, made out of spruce, spruce sorry, some made out of pine. Um, now, what's fascinating about these spears is that they are intentionally shaped in such a way that they are barreled at both ends, much like an Olympic javelin. So they became more efficient tools for throwing and taking down large game and hunting. Now, both terra amata and these javelins are associated with this species, Homo heidelberg ensis, that originated about 600,000 years ago. That's our oldest fossil. And he lived as late as 40,000 years ago. Now, this innovation of not only controlling fire, but cooking food, probably from the time of Homo erectus, um, is highly significant for hominid evolution. Cooked food is more efficient for your body to process than raw food, especially meat, and it undoubtedly allowed for a more quicker and more efficient development in brain size and brain capacity. We still today use about 25% of our available energy just in using of our brain. Now, these shelters, these homes, these hearths also show the beginnings of primitive domestic life or the divvying up of responsibilities for the sake of the group or the tribe. Now, our story changes rather dramatically about 100,000 years ago. In Blombos Cave in Blombosfontein Park near Cape Town, South Africa, um, all of these artifacts were found. Now, a quick look and see that these are markedly different than the hand axes and artifacts associated with the rectus, ergaster, and heidelbergensis. We see evidence of intentionally tooled shell beads of fragments of ochre marked with symmetrical hatching patterns. 
and hand axes that are more purposefully, more efficiently built, and that just in fact work better. Um, this site dates to about 100 to 70,000 years ago. About 90,000 years ago, found in Congo, is the Katanda bone harpoon. Not only well made for harpooning large fish, but as the kids might say, it's cool. It's beautiful to look at. It is not only functional, but it's beautiful. And finally, about 40,000 years ago, you see this mural here of a rhino and some horses. This is in Chauvy Cave in France. It dates from about 40 to 35,000 years ago. Um, in fact, I can't highly recommend enough the documentary Cave of Forgotten Dreams by Werner Herzog, um, which talks is the whole tour and story of Chauvy Cave. In fact, this mural of horses, if you take a torch in the cave and flicker it, it creates the illusion of horse movement. These last three slides have shown something quite different than we've seen in any of the hominids in our story so far. We see evidence of symbolic making, beautiful making, artistic making. These three finds are associated with this film. This skull from Jebel Irhud uh, near Safi, Morocco is one of the earliest examples of what a scientist would call the skull of an anatomically modern human. Someone whose skull differs in ours in no appreciable way. This skull, by the way, is about 250 to 300,000 years old. So anatomically modern humans, if this skull is any indication, were around for at least 150,000 years before they began leaving any traces that we would identify human artifacts. Now, what are we to make of this story? Where are we in this story? Now that's what this talk is going to be about. What does this story bring to bear on Catholic doctrine, Catholic dogma, the commitments of divine revelation regarding human origins. To that end, I'm going to do four things in this talk. First, what makes a human being? What does it mean when we claim that a human being is radically different than every other creature known in the cosmos? Two, what is soul and what is a soul? Because we will talk about how the rational soul makes us different. Three, what is rationality? Four, to give you tools to think about what insolment might mean regarding the first humans. And then fifth, how does all of this come together and how can this all be put into dialogue with our dogmatic com commitments as Roman Catholics regarding Adam, Eve, and original sin? In order to answer our questions, the questions of this talk, we need to shift perspective. Now, for most of the story I've told, we've been relying on what we might call the scientific perspective, uh, kind of a method or way of seeing and looking at things in the world. Now, any kind of biological classification, and in this case it's been of members of the genus Homo, has been based on morphological features, genetic characteristics. Uh, whether the specimen is bipedal, has a skull of a certain type, a certain kind of skeletal structure, etc. Now, this kind of taxonomy, this kind of classification, is concerned with only uh, what I would call the extrinsic or the outside of things. Uh, those aspects of things that are empirical, quantifiable, or measurable. Now, it's not really concerned at all with what I'm going to call the inside or the intrinsic features of things, their nature, their being, etc. Now, when this process is used in isolation, when you pretend it's the only way to look at things, um, it's quite natural for one to think that members of the genus Homo, Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, Homo sapiens, us, differ only in degree and not in kind. Well, what do I mean by that? Things that differ in degree 
differ in one aspect or another, and the difference between them is in principle bridgeable by development. So let's say we have two line segments, one three centimeters long, one six centimeters long. They would differ only in degree in the respect of length. All you'd have to do is shorten one or lengthen the other and they would be the same. Now, this is different than a difference in kind or a radical difference in kind. So for example, take a polygon, a square, and a kind of ellipse, let's take a perfect circle. Now, polygons by definition have sides and angles. Ellipses or circles do not. So let's say if we were to try to draw a million-sided polygon, now, you can add as many definite sides to a polygon as you want. And as long as it's a definite, a real amount of sides, um, you will never get an ellipse. Because even though it may appear to be a circle, upon closer inspection, it would have sides and angles. For all you math people out there, I know the infinite limit of a polygon is an ellipse. But that has to do with infinite sides in ideal mathematics. I'm talking about what one can actually inscribe. So the idea is in an inscribed polygon, no matter how many sides you add, you'll never really get an ellipse because the two differ in kind. The idea being there is no developmental continuity between the two. Now what we're gonna do is not leave this perspective behind, but take a new one that is wider. It'll be the perspective of what we might call perennial or scholastic philosophy. Um, and by the way, it's not the only kind of philosophy, but it's the one I've chosen for this talk. Now, from this perspective, looking at human beings by way of what we might call philosophical anthropology, it attempts to classify things according to insights we have into things' natures. Things reveal their natures to us, never completely, but reveal their natures to us by how they act and what they do what they are and what we are is manifested in what we do. What we do is a manifestation of or follows what we are. This philosophical perspective will be concerned with the intrinsic or the interior of things. We might make reference to physical or morphological characteristics, but only insofar as they serve as evidence for the being or the nature of things. Now, from this philosophical perspective, the one of perennial or scholastic philosophy, and in fact, it was the one shared by virtually all of Western philosophy until fairly recently, is that human beings differ radically in kind from all other living creatures known or that we know of. Because the human being is, quote, a rational animal in possession of a rational soul. So the idea is that Having a rational soul is what separates human beings from all other living creatures. Which brings us to the question, what is a soul? Now, to do this, we're gonna draw on the patrimony, the heritage of scholastic philosophy. Think someone like St. Thomas Aquinas, and um, those that would find his tradition valuable today, me being a one among one of them. Now, the scholastics would look at it this way. When we look out into the world and our experience of the world, we see at the beginning two fairly different kinds of things or beings. There are some things that not only are acted upon, but act, but do. Things that are self-movers and not only moved by others. Things that, as it were, live from the inside out. Why do frogs jump around, reproduce, and grow? Um, and chunks of sandstone do not. That's the question. What makes one a living from the inside out kind of being and the other not? Now, following Aristotle, St. Thomas thought that you couldn't explain this difference in things with simply recourse to what they're made of. Um, following Aristotle's philosophy of nature, um, Aquinas thought that everything, every physical thing, was composed physically of the same basic stuff. Um, for them, it was earth, air, fire, and water. The question was, if everything is made of the same basic stuff, 
why do things end up in real life, end up being unique, different kinds of things, different kinds of holes? Now, we may have discarded earth, air, fire, and water, but we remarkably do agree with the ancients that everything is, in fact, physically composed of the same basic kind of stuff. So the question still remains, why does this same basic kind of stuff in one instance end up being a frog, an identifiable, organized center of being in action, an atom of carbon, a used car salesman, whatever. Recourse to just the stuff, what they all have in common, can't account for how they're different. So to solve this problem, following ancient thinkers, Aquinas maintained that all physical things are composed of two principles. One principle he called matter, think of it in terms of just physical constituents, and the other principle they called form, as in a principle that organizes physical constituents into definite kinds of things, definite kinds of wholes. So the terms form and matter tend to be in modern talk a bit misleading, but stay with me for a second. What we're just trying to do is explain how the world is made up of different and fairly radically different kinds of physical things. Now, this idea of material and an organizing principle needs to be understood with some subtlety. Um, Aquinas and no one following him has ever claimed that the principle of organization form is a thing and the material building blocks are a thing. They're two component principles of all things. You never have an organized material on its own, unorganized by nothing. You never have a principle of organization organizing nothing. Now, this was used, this form, or this form of thought, was used by them to explain living things. That the world is made up of two basic kinds of physical things those with a form of being alive, those with an organizing principle that are inanimate. The organizing principle of living material things, they called soul. In Latin anima, in Greek, psuche. They called it the form of the living body. That principle, which accounts for a physical organized structure, organized in such a way that it makes certain physical things living, self-movers, self-organizing centers of being and of action. Now, make no mistake, even when it'll come to us, Aquinas never talks about soul being a thing and body another thing. But both soul, the principle of organization, and body, that which is organized, two aspects of one thing, Many of us today, even Christians, when we think about soul, we tend to think of some mysterious ghostly entity dwelling somewhere deep inside of us, the real us, that sort of thing. Um, in uh, Catholic theology, even in fact, uh, such a thing can be farther from the truth. Um, according to St. Thomas, the soul is not the entire man, quote, I am not my soul. That each of us is one thing, with two aspects that the mind can discern. That which is organized, that which does the organizing. That which organizes living things, that makes them centers of being in action, whole things, is soul. Strangely enough, this idea, um, at least the idea, is in subtle ways present in some movements in modern biology. Um, here's a quotation from the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington. Quote, systems biology is based on the understanding that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It is a holistic approach to deciphering the complexity of biological systems that starts with the understanding that the networks that form the whole of living organisms are more than the sum of their parts. Now, the main interest in systems biology is treating organisms like wholes rather than a collection of parts because it's been a very successful way to model bodies in order to gain insight into their functioning and also to come up with treatments for disease states. 
but also if a systems biologist were to ask the question, why is it that it's fruitful and better to see organisms as wholes, to explain them in a way from the top down rather than the bottom up? Somebody like St. Thomas would be, would say, the concept of soul supplies that answer. Now in looking at the world following St. Thomas, or St. Thomas rather following Aristotle, um, they saw kind of a broad category of three different kinds of living things, or in other words, three different kinds of soul. You had vegetative kinds of things, sensitive or animal kinds of things, and then us, an animal, and rational kind of thing. And they did think that, by the way, vegetative, animal, and rational life all differed radically in kind from one another. Um, that's a thesis I'm not interested in defending in this talk, but only to defend the thesis that human beings, that rational life, differs radically in kind, and why. Now, before we get into that, I want to do this. So we, we looked at our story and we saw all of these marvelous behaviors um, and marvelous, what we might call fossilized behaviors, the footprints, um, the shelter at Terra Amata, et cetera. Um, as evidence of what our hominid species ancestors could do and accomplish. Now some look at this record and then look at us and conclude that what we are and what we do is no more than a more complex form of what they did, and hence we differ only in degree. I would like rather to look at that evidence again through the lens of somebody like St. Thomas, um, in light of what he says or what he has to say about our animal capacities or the capacities we share with all other animals. Now, St. Thomas thought that nature generally outfits animals with what they need to successfully navigate the world. In addition to talking about our kind of external sensory apparatus, um, he talks at length about what he calls our interior sense powers. Or in other words, you look at animals' behavior and you infer they must have some capacity, in fact, to do these kinds of things. So Aquinas thought animals were capable of some fairly complex and marvelous sorts of behaviors. Um, so for example, um, he thought that animals, in addition to being aware of external objects by way of their external senses, touch, sight, smell, etc., that animals could obviously distinguish between this sensory input. So that my Australian Shepherd Harper, I'm gonna use an example for all of this, um, is aware of what he's seen, what he's smelled, and what he's heard. And that what he's seen is different than what he's smelled. What he's heard is different than what he's seen, etc. Um, and maybe even to tell the difference between some act of fantasy or a dream and what he's actually experiencing. Um, Aquinas called this power the common sense, the ability to distinguish between different kinds of sensations, distinguish, compare, know that one is not the other. Now, Aquinas didn't have to be an animal psychologist to see that sophisticated animals have both memory and imagination. They can retain sense experiences. They can remember what they've seen and heard, etc. They can learn from what they've seen, what they've heard, etc. Um, and can almost certainly conjure up mental pictures of things they've seen and heard, etc. So that they're able to remember and learn from past experiences like we do. He called those powers memory and imagination. Now, there's one final power of animals that um, is really quite interesting. It's what Aquinas called the estimative power. What does he mean by this? That it is immediately apparent um, if any of you owned a pet, by the way, that animals are able to direct their mental activities toward external objects in such a way that they perceive in external objects more than is present in them. What do I mean? Animals in their experiences can perceive things as beneficial or harmful, useful or not useful. So for example, um, a bowery bird, they build these little homes in order to catch mates, or to catch mates, to have mates. So when the bowery bird sees a piece of straw, grass, or lint from your couch, and it registers to him as good for a nest, 
is good for a nest a feature of lint in your couch? No, it's something added to that by the Bowery bird. When a chimp, and this is a brutal example by the way, when a chimp is picking sticks to spear a bush baby, the small monkey to eat it, and he finds one that's sharp and it registers to him as useful. Usefulness is not in the stick. Usefulness is in him as he goes and he chooses sticks. Well, this power is extraordinary. Um, it's evidence of what Aquinas called intentionality. The word intentionality here is philosophical jargon, by the way. Um, An intention for St. Thomas is a mental state about or directed toward an extra mental object. So that my dog Harper, um, or let's say one of our sheep, um, when they see Harper, he registers as dangerous to them, even though he's a lovable, he's a lovable little dog. There's nothing dangerous about him. But only in terms of the sheep. The sheep has a mental state where he registered as dangerous. Um, so look, this kind of mental capacity of animals um, can manifest itself in very complex behaviors. Now, you and I might say that it is somehow wired into an animal's biology to do so, and they do so on instinct. Fine. But that doesn't preclude that um, to do so, um, or that it being wired, can manifest itself in just some extraordinary ways. So, look, we know that plenty of animals, especially the great apes, make tools, primitive tools. They'll find sticks for spearing bush babies, chimps will use sticks to stick into a termite mound to get termites, etc. So tool making is an animal capacity. Chimpanzees and gorillas, bonobos too, and even baboons, um, exhibit um, a highly flexible social life, by the way. And in fact, you will have social characteristics that differ from gorilla tribe to gorilla tribe, etc. So being a social creature is not a uniquely human capacity. It's an animal capacity. Um, in fact, um, some animals have certain mental capacities and powers um, that are like our own, but in some ways are much more advanced than ours. So if you were listening to these powers and you say, well, I do all of this stuff too, just like the dog, you're exactly right. Because for Aquinas, these animal powers are animal powers. And insofar as we are animals, our powers do not differ in degree, in kind rather, from any other animals. But as you'll see, our additional capacity of reason transforms our animal powers in uniquely human ways. Um, and by the way, some of these animals do these things better than us. So eidetic or photographic memory. Um, chimpanzees can see in an instant a series of complex visual patterns, and then those patterns are taken away, and they can repeat them with a speed and an accuracy no human being can come even close to match, even close to match. So if Aquinas would see this evidence we've looked at so far, shelter making or tool making, not a rational capacity, an animal capacity, possibly shelter making, domestic life, rudimentarily speaking, control of fire and fire making are highly complex and utterly wonderful and extraordinary. But those abilities themselves are not necessarily evidence of what he meant and what we ought to mean when we talk about rationality. We do these things too, but the way in which we do them, the uniquely human way in which we do all of these things, will be because of rationality. Now look, what is rationality? Um, it's actually a fairly narrowly defined capacity and power. And so when I want you to think of how we're different, it's a very narrow thing that actually cashes out into some, some very large results. So according to the schoolmen and even the classical tradition of Western philosophy, the power of rationality is to abstract or extract universal ideas and concepts from experiences of particular things. Animals can make judgments about what's going on. 
but only we can stand back and make judgments about our judgments. After you and I see a nicely drawn red circle, we can put that experience at a distance and entertain some very strange ideas if you think about it. We can think of what it means to be a circle universally and generally, what it means to be round, what it means to be red, whether or not it's beautiful, whether or not it's true. This capacity to stand back from sense experience and universalize it is one of the key characteristic notes of reason. The ability to have insight and sometimes find out the natures of things, to think about and discover and entertain the universally necessary laws of mathematics and logic, um, to think with those thought processes that are wholly unambiguous and precise. These are what the tradition, and somebody like Aquinas means by reason. So it's not tool making that makes us human or as evidence of humanity, but it's making tools that are beautiful making tools that are artistic that makes us human. It's not organizing in highly complex social ways, but it's organizing ourselves at our best according to the notions of justice and right and law that make us human. It's what reason does and how reason acts upon our animal capacities that really show what the rational soul is doing to its animality. Now, let's move on with this basis and talk about Catholic dogma concerning the human soul. Now that we've defined, okay, this is what a soul is, this is what rationality is, this is how we're different. Now let's move to the theological perspective. Now we're going to put everything that I've done so far, that we've done together so far, um, in the context of Catholic dogma concerning the human being and body and soul in the human being. And I have, I'm going to do this in four points. Uh, first, um, the church teaches that every human being as one being is a unity of material body and a spiritual immortal soul, and that the soul is the form of the body. Um, it actually utilizes the jargon of scholastic philosophy that we've just gone through. Now this is only to say that each human being is a single unity, that just a soul is not a human being and just a body is not a human being, but that you need both to have one integral human being, one human person. So um, think of what each of us recites in the creed every Sunday about the resurrection of the body. This is crucial to understand. We profess the resurrection of the body in part because we are not complete without our bodies. So human beings, until the resurrection, are in some real way incomplete. This is why the resurrection is so crucial, that to live full eternal life in the kingdom is to live full human life, body and soul reunited in glory. Second point, the church teaches as dogma that each human soul is individual. Mine is mine, yours is yours. We don't share, all share in some kind of global world soul. And that each of our souls is, by the very nature of it, immortal, because it's immaterial and spiritual. Also, Therefore, every human soul, third point, is created, quote, immediately by God. This is defined at the Fifth Lateran Council. This is to say that human life cannot be explained or produced by the resources of nature alone, because it's immaterial and spiritual must be produced immediately by God. Now, um, Understanding this point and the idea of ensoulment correctly is crucial. It's crucial in general for a whole host of reasons, but it will be crucial for our further understanding of human origins, Adam and Eve, etc. Now, in thinking of ensoulment, what I want you to do, or what I would rather want you not to do, um, is think of ensoulment in terms of what I call the soul canon. 
meaning that every time human beings are attempting to reproduce and they successfully do so, God is in his heaven, locks and loads your soul in a cannon, waits for the right moments, let's say when gametes unite, and then boom, he fires an immortal soul into a body. That's not quite right. Um, the idea is that the human body and the human soul come to be simultaneously. Um, there's no soul canon because souls don't pre-exist our bodies. They are created simultaneously with our bodies. Remember, if a soul is the form of the body, the way our biological material is organized in a human way is because we have received a human immortal spiritual soul from God. That in an act of generation between two human beings, human beings co-create fully the human being with God. Now, look, um, it's always been understood um, by the scholastics, in fact, um, that when you have material biological conditions that are, quote, properly disposed, we would think of it in modern terms, as have achieved the proper kind of complexity, that that properly disposed matter or biological material becomes ensouled when it becomes properly disposed. So, for example, a man named John of St. Thomas, his real name was John Pulso, he was an early commentator on St. Thomas, puts it this way, that properly disposed matter, quote, calls out of natural justice to God for a soul. Here meaning that God has designed nature in such a way that in the normal course of nature, when the right biological conditions obtain, when matter is properly disposed, as in the case of human reproduction, that what happens by nature is that God gives a soul. And by the way, whether those proper biological conditions happen in a womb, in a cannula, or in any other sort of environment would make no difference, would make no difference. So I want you to think of insolvent in terms of soul and body coming together when the right biological conditions obtain. Now, let's put this in context of Catholic dogma, dogma concerning human origins. I wanna first lay out that dogma and then show you how that dogma can inform and be in dialogue with this story of human origins painted by modern science. So let's go through three or four points concerning what the church teaches definitively as divine revelation concerning human origins. And then we'll take that dogmatic data and see what we can do with it. So first, the church teaches that the first human being, Adam, was created by God through an act of, quote, special creation. This dogma has always been understood by theologians to not exclude created causes producing the man's first body only a soul, because remember, the soul can only come immediately from God. So this dogma does not preclude the possibility of God using creatures in order to produce the disposing biological conditions that call for ensoulment. Two, the church definitively teaches that both Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, had sanctifying grace and the preternatural gifts that accompanied sanctifying grace in the original moment. Think of the potential of immortality or being incorruptible. And that the vocation of Adam and Eve originally was to pass these gifts on to their posterity. But that Adam and Eve, third point, lost these gifts and therefore could no longer have the possibility of passing them on to their posterity by a historical sin, by something done and chosen in history. And that the consequences of this are, quote, passed on by generation to the rest of humanity. The consequences being coming into the world alienated from God and our supernatural purpose, coming into the world mortal and corruptible, etc. But these, connection with God, immortal, immortality, incorruption, were the results of gifts of grace, these preternatural gifts, not of human natural endowments by nature. Um, Aquinas talks about it this way that nature produced what it could with what it had, and then God 
completes and elevates nature with grace and preternatural gifts. Um, Aquinas says that sometimes you have to go with the best materials you have, even if they have a downside. So for example, um, when a man is trying to make a knife or an implement for cutting, he uses iron or steel. Uh, they're workable, you can work them easily, you can get them to keep and take an edge, etc. But they have a downside. They need to be sharpened. If it's just iron, it'll rust, etc. So in that way, nature produced what it could, and then God elevated what nature produced. Final point. Um, original sin, this alienation from God with which we all come into the world, consists primarily of the deprivation or a lack of sanctifying grace. If a lack of grace and sin are death of the soul, then sanctifying grace is the life of the soul. So when it's taken away, all of these consequences follow. In other words, when grace is taken away, we fall back on the resources of just nature, of what nature could produce without a gift of grace to elevate it to its supernatural purpose. This understanding of original sin would be crucial for us to understand or have a sophisticated understanding of um, Adam and Eve, original sin, and how it might cohere with the modern evolutionary synthesis. That original sin is primarily being without something not having an extra bad something. Now we have one final problem. Do we all come from Adam and Eve or do we not? Now, those of you who know something about the modern evolutionary synthesis, especially in terms of genetics, are probably familiar with the idea that in order to account for all of the genetic diversity we happen to actually find here and now, we would need something like 10,000 members or a founder population of around 10,000 members. Uh, now, 10,000 is more than two, even if it was significantly less than 10,000, it is still more than two. Uh, this led in the mid 20th century um, to controversies over two ideas, an idea of monogenism, that we all come from one couple, mono one, versus polygenism, that we all come from several couples, or in other words, a population. Um, now this idea found a very cool reception, polygenism did, in the mid 20th century, as evidenced by this quotation from Pope Pius XII, in an encyclical he wrote in 1951 entitled Humane Generis. The uh, topic of the encyclical was the unity of the human race. Uh, Pope Pius says, quote, when, however, there is question of another conjectural opinion. This, by the way, is right after he said, you can hold evolution all you want as long as it's in terms of the human body and not the soul. Namely, polygenism, the children of the church by means, by no means, enjoy such liberty, as in to hold it as a position. For the faithful cannot embrace that opinion, polygenism, which maintains that either after Adam there existed on this earth true men who did not take their origin through natural generation from him, as from the first parent of all, or that Adam represents a certain number of first parents. Now it is in no way apparent how such an opinion can be reconciled with that which the sources of revealed truth and the documents of the teaching authority of the church propose with regard to original sin, which proceeds from a sin actually committed by an individual Adam and which, through generation, is passed on to all and is in everyone as his own. Now, in context, Pius XII is talking about polygenism in terms of what was called the multi-regional hypothesis, where he had several different groups of Homo sapiens um, kind of evolving all over the planet simultaneously, not all coming from one. But he is also concerned with the notion that um, if you have more than one um, first couple, then that would seem to run afoul of the notion of a historical choice and the consequences of that historical choice being passed on to the rest of us as Adam's descendants. 
Um, and if that's not the case, thus we have no need for redemption in Christ, etc. Now, for about 53 years, um, that statement stood to be the only thing that the magisterium had ever said on the matter until the year 2004. In 2004, a body called the International Theological Conf uh, Commission, sorry, um, whose prefect or head, by, by the way, was one Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, produced a document called Communion and Stewardship. Um, it was about a Christian theological understanding of creation. Now, there's an interesting um, paragraph in Communion and Stewardship, which kind of in an offhand way addresses monogenism and polygenism. After talking about modern findings, essentially in genetics, the document reads this, quote, while the story of human origins is complex and subject to revision, physical anthropology and molecular biology combine to make a convincing case for the origin of the human species in Africa about 150,000 years ago in a humanoid population of common genetic lineage. Catholic theology affirms that the emergence of the first members of the human species, wait for it, whether as individuals or in populations, represents an event that is not susceptible of a purely natural explanation and which can appropriately be attributed to divine intervention. Now, if you're keeping track, it is very difficult not to see um, the International Theological Commission floating polygenism as a live option. Well, a couple of things to think about as you're trying to process, well, how is this compatible with Pius XII? Um, it's not at all clear that it is, by the way, but here's the things we do know. Um, that this document was read and approved by Joseph Ratzinger. It was known about by then Pope John Paul II, now Pope St. John Paul II, and both knew exactly what was in it um, and released it knowing that. And it has just been let float out there ever since then with no any more word by the magisterium. So the question then becomes, how do we take this and make sense of it and at the same time to reconcile or put into fruitful dialogue Catholic dogma concerning human origins and Adam and Eve and the evidence of the modern evolutionary synthesis. By the way, uh, my job as a theologian is to put the two in dialogue and see how they might work. Um, I know very well it may turn out that certain theories of human origins may change in light of new evidence. That doesn't concern me. What concerns me is how to put the evidence as it stands right now in dialogue and see how it might work. So what I'm gonna offer you now is a proposal, and it is only a proposal, but I think a fruitful one, that here is a way to envision human origins um, in light of the scientific evidence in a way that is still compatible with Catholic dogmatic commitments. So here we go. I submit it for your approval. So first, let's imagine um, that at some point in history, let's say for the sake of simplicity around 150,000 years ago, but as you've seen in the evidence, possibly before, a genetic mutation appears in hominids. A genetic mutation that would dispose hominids, dispose their biology, for the, for the reception of a rational or spiritual soul. And that this mutation is at one point passed on, passed on to progeny of one lucky hominid couple. And that this mutation, the only way it is passed on is through procreation, like all mutations are passed on. So that in the womb of some early hominid, in light of a mutation is produced a creature with the capacity for rationality, is produced a creature with the capacity for a spiritual soul. Remember, ensoulment is simultaneous with the properly disposing biological conditions. When the two gametes met 
in the womb of this hominid, just like they meet in the womb of any human woman today, the same process occurs. You have in the meeting of those two gametes, properly disposed biological matter to receive an irrational, immortal soul. Now this first man and first woman were the issue of very genetically similar non-human hominid parents. Now, if you find this unsettling because it seems undignified for the first human beings to be the issue of non-human parents, you might want to ask yourself if coming from mud, clay, or slime, as the old Vulgate of Genesis read, is somehow more dignified. But leave that aside for a second. So this first, these first humans, and we'll say Adam and Eve, man and woman, come into the world in grace and with some version of the attendant preternatural gifts, at the very least immortality and incorruption. They come into the world, in our jargon, in original justice and original holiness. And they lose these gifts by a historical act, some choice, um, some form of pride, that's how the tradition privileges the first sin. What did they do? Don't know. What were the conditions under which they did it? Don't know. When did they do it? Don't know. There is nothing in Catholic dogma, by the way, that says that Adam and Eve had to be in a state of original justice and holiness for any significant length of time. Now, in fact, there's a speculation by St. Maximus the Confessor in some letters he wrote to a colleague named Thessalius, it's in Ad Thessalium number 61, where he speculates that the fall of Adam and Eve was in the very moment of, or very soon after their creation. That of course has problems of its own, but the point is um, they don't have to be alive living in the world with these gifts for very long necessarily. So however it happened, as soon as Adam and Eve fall, that means from that moment forward, they don't have something, that they've lost something. They've lost sanctifying grace and all of the preternatural gifts. That means that now they are only left with the resources of nature, pure and simple. Um, as Aquinas might say, they revert back to or fall back upon their animal natures. So now you're left with human beings with no culture, no history, therefore no language. And you and I know that human rationality in order to flower and develop, and even in many ways to become operationally evident, needs culture needs language, and developing language requires other people and an attendant culture. And first and foremost, they have no grace to elevate any of these things. They now have to engage in the long climb to operational flowered rationality. They now have completely untutored human nature with none of the normal resources human nature needs to become tutored, even natural, ordinary resources that you and I have. They would plausibly become virtually indistinguishable empirically from the non-humans from which they issued and which they're surrounded with. So in addition to breeding with each other, it isn't unlikely at all that they wouldn't have bred with any other available hominids. Um, look, we know with a fairly high degree of probability that any of us with largely European ancestry have Neanderthal DNA, and that Homo sapiens and Neanderthal were genetically similar enough to interbreed. Um, so that Adam and Eve, now fallen back to the resources of their nature, would have done so and could have done so um, is no crazy thought. Um, and by the way, if bestiology, the idea of bestiality you find unsettling, it's either this or you have to sleep with your sister. So you gotta pick one. <laughs>
It's either bestiality or it's incest. So pick one. Now, when Adam and Eve are now most probably interbreeding with the rest of the hominids around them, they're passing on the disposing genetic mutation without grace. They're passing on, they're actually passing on a computer that just went to sleep. They're passing on this genetic mutation, be it a mutation for language acquisition or what have you, that's not the, we can argue about that later. They're passing on the possibility of properly disposed matter receiving a human soul. Now without grace, therefore, humanity coming into the world in original sin, alienated from God. So think about this for a second. In this way, um, we all do come from Adam and Eve. We receive our humanity from them, just not quite in the way that we might have thought, because we've had up to now no reason to think otherwise. Um, and furthermore, look, uh, being, again, being born in original sin is just no more than to being born without grace, that it was our original parents' vocation to give to us. Being born in original sin is just having the resources of nature without grace. Remember, our purpose and end is to see God forever. Um, mere nature itself cannot give it to us. Only an added gift of grace elevating nature can do so. Um, and furthermore, there's no need to worry about the term guilt. Um, so this is often overlooked in discussions of original sin. Um, as far as church teaching goes, for Adam and Eve alone was the first sin a culpa, in Latin for um, moral guilt. Only they are morally guilty for what they did. The rest of us bear something called reatus, um, it's a Latin legal term. It means not moral guilt, but legal guilt. It's a way of saying we all share in the consequences of the sorry condition that they inflicted on themselves and now the rest of their progeny. So look, this, this, this proposal that I've just given you, um, I think does a couple of things. Um, it preserves that we have a first couple. It preserves their vocation. Um, it preserves the notions of original holiness. It preserves the notion of original sin and a need for redemption in Christ. So we can hold, this is just a way, to hold everything that divine revelation has given us and that the church has offered as divine revelation um, and still see that it's not incompatible with the best reason has to offer, scientifically speaking, about human origins. Now, look, this proposal, this theory, is of course fraught with questions and problems. Every theory is. If my proposal would have been too neat, could have taken into account of all the data, you probably should suspect I was cooking the data somewhere, even in terms of scientific theories. If there are no anomalies, if it explains the data too well, something is probably wrong. So look, Thank you for listening. Um, I hope this talk has been helpful, um, a helpful way to give you tools to think about scientifically the human story and how this story um, can be put into fruitful dialogue with divine revelation and to show that faith in divine revelation and reason, even in this case, scientific reason, um, can be in all relevant ways compatible. So thank you for your time. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. God bless.